Good day, Colin. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this with me and let me record it so that I can share uh, our dialogue, our questions and answers with others, because I'm guessing that other people uh, might have similar questions and can learn something from this. Guy, thanks so much for making the time to have this conversation. I'm really excited. I'm happy to do that. I'm all about uh, helping others to climb that learning and performance curves, if you will. Uh, before we launch into the questions that you had that you shared with me in advance, um, can you give us a little bit of your background in learning and development, um, where you are on that learning and performance curve, uh, perhaps what your job responsibilities are now and why you're interested in uh, this that we're going to be discussing? Yeah, absolutely. So again, my name is Colin Hahn. I'm a learning and organizational development manager at about a 2,000 person manufacturing company. And so I've got responsibility for the entirety of our people development strategy. Um, you and I have had a couple of conversations before. And um, so this is uh, advancing some of my understanding of some of these techniques. I had shared how earlier I had a, a situation where I got to apply some of this uh, performance focused instruction analysis um, and really uh, was able to, I think, circumvent what could have been a huge waste of time. The, the situation was that we had um, press break operators, you know, people who are bending sheets of metal. And, you know, we had a stakeholder, business leader who came up and said, well, you know, we're uh, bending the metal too far. And so we're having a lot of scrap. We need to train these operators on how to measure their bends more effectively. Um, and when we got into it, we realized, well, this isn't really a knowledge and skill problem. This is that there's different machines that have different setups. Um, and so there's just not standard processes for how you dial it in, um, or that there's not shared expectations among the operators for like what counts as a long piece of metal that you've got to measure in multiple places. And so, you know, you and I, we had a previous conversation where we talked about the first part of this process where we identified the areas of performance. We started mapping out, okay, so what is for that particular area of performance? What is the output? What are some of the major activities there? The common deficiencies? Is that a deficiency of knowledge or a deficiency of process, deficiency of the environment? Um, and so that technique was really helpful for me. We're now having this follow-up conversation where we're going to dig into two aspects of this and maybe more. We'll see where this goes. Um, one is how that enabling knowledge and skills matrix kind of fits in with that. Because um, there's a lot going on there. And I don't know if I've got a, a, a good enough understanding yet of how to put that into practice. Um, and then maybe shifting gears a little bit and thinking about then deploying content to different audiences, especially with the idea of going towards where we've got like, you know, poll type resources or performance guidance rather than necessarily training resources um, and classes, things like that. Um, and so I'll I'll use that as kind of a, a setup for our conversation. Um, any Anything you want to add to that before we jump into our first set of questions? No. So uh, go ahead and shoot. So let's, let's start off for our audience with, uh, you know, what, how can I help you? Yeah. All right. So, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, performance focused, you know, analysis process. And you've got um, this uh, methodology where you, know, you identify the major areas of performance within that you've mapped out both what ideal performance looks like, what are the, the outputs and the tasks, where the quality standards for those. And then we talk about some of the common deficiencies um, and we map out, is that a deficiency of knowledge, deficiency of process, environment, and so on. Um, once we work our way through that process with the group of experts, then there is a, a follow on conversation that happens with them about driving the enabling knowledge and skill categories. And in a couple of your books, I'm sure in some of your blog posts as well, um, you've got a list of those categories. Some of those are, are relatively uh, sensical to me. So if I think about things like policies, right, and I'm talking with a, a supervisor about, you know, what are the enabling knowledge and skills to be good at having difficult conversations with your employees, right? Well, the progressive discipline policy is probably going to be a piece of that. So policies, laws, product process knowledge, those are some of the categories where I think I've got an understanding of what the output looks like. Um, but I have a harder time envisioning what level of specificity to dig into for categories like personal or interpersonal skills or professional knowledge and skills, functional knowledge and skills, those sorts of things. And so um, maybe a starting point for this question, just talk a little bit about when you're doing that 
process with the group of master performers, what does the, uh, the output look like for those less concrete enabling knowledge and skill categories? Like when do you know, okay, I need to get a little bit deeper and, and get some more clarity on this? Or when are you just adding more ink to the paper um, without really being able to add value later in the process? Well, I think that, uh, so one of the issues is that you want to go broadly, but not necessarily deeply because, it, and it all depends on your methodology. So a lot of my methodology is I do macro analysis in my analysis phase. When I get into design, I'm doing a little bit more analysis. So you could call that mid-level. And when I get into my development phase, I'm doing micro analysis because I have to get it all because I have to write it or document it or put it on a video or, or you know, make it uh, uh, tangible, physical somehow in, in terms of a learning and development product. And so I, I don't feel it's necessary to get all the nuances of what do we mean by that knowledge and skill item. I'm just using the performance data that we have, both ideal performance and the gap analysis data to anchor the knowledge and skill analysis back to performance. So we systematically look at each area of performance. Usually we're mm -hmm. looking at one or more major outputs in an area of performance. Um, and we're using that to stimulate the thinking, to focus the thinking of our analysis participants, usually master performers, sometimes other subject matter experts, sometimes supervisors, and sometimes novice performers. So if we're using Addy as a model, when we're doing that, that first D, design, you know, what are the outputs? What are the tasks? How do you know good outputs from bad outputs? What are the typical problems where people don't meet the standards or measurement requirements of the various stakeholders when they're producing those outputs? All right, so then we can say, so what do you gotta know to be able to do? And so I usually have those flip charts on those the, that data on flip chart pages on the wall, and I move the table and all the chairs as close to the wall as I can so that I can stand in it and write down and edit. And then I set up a flip chart easel and I go systematically one knowledge and skill category at a time and review all of my analysis data. Um, so I might start off with, okay, so what are the uh, laws, regulations, and codes that you need to know when you're doing area performance one with those outputs and those tasks. Oh, and look at those deficiencies. What comes to mind in terms of laws, regulations, codes, and contracts? Uh, the next category, and, and, and we would look at every area of performance, and I invite the group at that time, if you see any holes in the data, in the performance data, let's capture those. You know, don't be shy. And um, because I know that you were incomplete, because this is how knowledge works, you know, the non-conscious nature of knowledge, automated knowledge, et cetera. So when we're looking back at that performance data, feel free to add to it or correct it. But, but our focus is on one knowledge and skill category at a time. So we might go from laws, regulations, and codes to company policies and procedures. And we might go then into what are some of the internal organizations and then another category, the external organizations that you have to interface. You know, when you're doing design, do you do you interface with anybody inside the company for design or outside the company for design? You know, yes or no is the answer. And if there's yes, then we list those things. We just bullet them out. Now we're, we're you know, and there may be nuanced details about how much, you know, we talk to them a little bit or we talk to this other group a lot. We don't care about necessarily that to start generating these lists of enabling knowledge and skills. Um, and so, but when we get to some of the, so there's 17 categories of knowledge and skills. When I first started doing this back in 1982 as a consultant, I had eight categories of knowledge and skills. But I, I make, and so whether there's eight or 17, it's like, you know, can you divide an elephant up into diff, eight different parts or 17 different parts? Well, yeah, it's, <laughs> Yes, you can. And so there's more granularity in the 17 categories, and it focuses my uh, analysis team on something a little bit more specific. And laws, regulations, and codes are different than policies and procedures. And in a highly regulated industry, they often overlap mightily. So you only really need to do company policies and procedures because they square you with the law and you don't need to worry about that as a separate category. 
but but so you can talk about well what organization do you work with well let's first think about those people inside our company and then outside you know do we need to talk to you know vendors on the outside and so again that that's just narrowing the focus of the thinking of the people who are looking at the performance data and thinking about outside people outside vendors you know consultants, whatever, su supplier, you know, when we're doing those things, does anything come to mind? And so I'm usually systematically walking up and down the analysis data, pointing at this output and these tasks, and then this output and these tasks, and asking my question about who on the outside do you work with? Well, you can get to categories later on, such as interpersonal skills and personal development skills. Now, interpersonal skills to me is when you're dealing with you know, other people like, you know, I, my communication skills and uh, uh, my negotiation skills and persuasion skills. Those are some examples that typically come up uh, depending on, you know, what the performance is. And then there's the personal development things where I'm, I need to have these things that are personal skills. It was just the category that I came up with, you know, oodles of years ago, but, but they don't necessarily involve me interacting with other people. So I can do project planning and uh, without having other people there doing it, I can map out a project plan. And so that's something that, you know, so a lot of these categories towards the end of the list of 17 um, are kind of catch all categories, especially the last two. And you asked about them in particular, and those were the professional technical skills as category number 16. And then finally at 17, there's functional specific. So you're an engineer working in the purchasing organization. So your professional technical skill is your engineering stuff, but you're, but you have to know something about purchasing because you're working in that department or your job requires you to work with that department. And so you need to know a little bit about purchasing. So what are the things about purchasing that you would need to know? What are the things about engineering that you would need to know? So when I explain to group about these two categories, when they get into them, because they're all, you know, my analysis teams have almost always been, you know, what's that all about? You know, what do you mean by that? And, but it's really to kind of catch all everything. So you're a professional. What are your professional skills that you're bringing to the party that we haven't already listed? Because our rule is, hey, if we've identified something in a previous knowledge and skill category, let's not relist it here. If we've got it once, we've got it. Because what we're creating here is a bill of materials. Manufacturing people will understand what this means. A bill of materials for the eventual instruction. Not that we would build all of it or do something about all of it. But if we were to do all of it, this is the list that it must contain. All of these are the piece parts of an eventual set of curricula or instruction or learning. And... So that's what we're generating. So if we could have put uh, project planning in three different places, let's not do that because that just makes it more cumbersome to go through that later on when we use this data in design, when we process the analysis data in our design methods. And that's how my methods work. I'm not generating any analysis data that I don't touch in the design phase and decide, okay, what do we do with this item? And, what, and where does it go? And, you know... And, and the next item. And so everything, whether it's the performance data, where do these outputs and tasks get covered? Where do we cover these gaps right then and there? Or do we save it till later because there's other things? You know, when does it make sense logical to my design team at that point? But anyway, so that's, that's the answer. So professional and technical skills could be, you know, welding. Uh, it could be uh, uh, negotiating uh, contracts. You know, so there's something that may not have come up elsewhere. And what I found is that my analysis team, they sometimes begin to get antsy, like, okay, there's things here that they know that should be on our dang list and it's not showed up yet here. And where are the, you know, so this kind of gives everybody an opportunity to get those things out. The other advantage of the, of the method I've talked about is that, you know, for each knowledge and skill category, all 17 of them, if I ever use all 17, and I have a few times, but most of the time you use a subset. Maybe it's somewhere between 11 and 15 or whatever. Who knows? And But every time you go to a new category, you start off with the first area of performance and then go to the second and third and fourth. 
And so what, what I'm doing, and I tell the group that because they get wise of this eventually, I said, see, I'm forcing you to look at that analysis data about performance over and over and over and over again, because I know it's incomplete. Now, I don't want to go deep on anything. I don't want you to take one of the tasks there and detail out, well, there's really 17 subtasks. We don't need to do that. I want to know if there's a missing task. I want to know if there's a missing output. I want to know if there's a missing uh, stakeholder measurement for that output. I want to know if there's other, in our role responsibility data, are there other players in the sandbox of performance? And eventually... And what and I got rewarded for this really early in my career when I started using this, people kept on adding to the data, which told me over and over again, it was incomplete. <laughs> and and at some point, you know, their arguments uh, are come out with the group. If somebody says something and somebody disagrees, I always put it up there and then asterisk it, it and write down a comment that says, you know, this happens on the West Coast, but not on the East Coast, as an example, because there's differences depending on our target audience and where performance occurs if it happens in a geographically dispersed manner there could be different practices in one shop versus another that are appropriate in one shop and maybe they're appropriate in the other shop or maybe not as always it depends and so i want to have that dialogue and understand that i don't write everything down that i uncover because I can rely on my memory and I'm usually doing this with a, another co-facilitator so that, you know, they may be making copious notes back at the desk where they're sitting, but, but that's the nature of it. So we're, we're generating whatever comes off the top of the heads of the people. Um, we're you, we're capturing it in their language. I always say, you know, somebody says something, I'm going to write it down. I'm not going to look and see if everybody agrees. As they said it, they're bold enough to say it. I'm going to write it down. Then I'm going to turn to all of you and I'm going to do face polling. I'm going to look into your eyes and your eyes and your eyes and your eyes. And you can help me by agreeing to what I wrote down by nodding your head this way, which means yes. Or you can do this, which means no, you don't agree. Or you can do it diagonally and saying, I don't know, I'm not sure. Uh, and that's our little joke that we have so we can have some fun with this. But but I need to let everybody know that we're building a consensus model here. We don't have to have perfect agreement across everybody to put something up there. But if something should go up there, we want to capture it. And later on, when we're doing design or when we're doing development, we can drop it. Or when we're reviewing our data with the clients and stakeholders, they might drop it. So, but we're here to try to capture as as much as we can, breadth wise, and not necessarily in depth. Does that help? It does. So, so let's think about how this plays out then further down the process. So, let's say that we've gotten you know negotiations as one of these you know professional knowledge skill areas. Let's assume that our stakeholders have said it makes sense to move on to the design phase as a business decision, right? Not, mm -hmm. not yep. always the case, but we'll pretend that that's happened for right now. And so now you've got a designer who's uh, looking at this data um, and they see, you know, negotiation skills is the idea that they're then going to the master performers again and saying, all right, so you said we need negotiation skills in order, you know, and we're talking about these outputs or maybe these gaps. Tell me a little bit more about what's missing there. All like right. I, so I think we need to go back to what is the knowledge and skill matrices. It's more than just a list of the knowledge and skills category by category. It also then says when we list these things, we matrix them to area performance number one, two, three, four, or five, or whatever the number of area performances are. Usually there's seven, eight, or nine. I've had up to 27 before, uh, mm -hmm. and that was for a huge uh, process uh, for one of my clients. And and uh, But anyway, uh, so, so we're always saying it, here's this knowledge and skill that's needed, we systematically derived it when we were looking at area performance three. Mm -hmm. That's when it came up. And then I ask, is it used in one and two as well? Well, yes or no is the answer. And then later on, we'll go, is it for four or five or six or seven? Because just because it came up, it finally came up or it came up early. 
a number three doesn't mean that it wasn't for one and two. So it's negotiations when I'm doing the tasks involved in producing the outputs in area performance three, and maybe not one or two, but maybe in area performance seven, somebody says, oh yeah, you'll be negotiating down there too. Because mm -hmm. we've got that data on the wall and they can tell me. Now I'm not trying to pin it down to which task I'm just trying, or which output in an area performance. And this kind of goes back to, you know, how big an area performance should it be? Is an area performance, you know, learning and development, you know, development? No, it's analysis, design and development, some level of performance where the activity set and the outputs are different than they uh, along the way. But you can granularize areas of performance too greatly as well. So this is one of the arts within the science of doing analysis and configuring that kind of stuff so so that but we're gathering other data we say it's this knowledge and skill item and no kidding it relates to error performances three and seven now there's other data that we capture about that is that something we select for all the time every time you know writing skills you know english as a as a language you know whether it's first or second language you know yes or no is the answer we either select for that we don't hire people who don't speak English, mm -hmm. or we don't hire people that can't read, mm -hmm. if we're getting on to uh, details. Um, or no, we sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. You know, we look for that, we try to hire for that, but sometimes people come in and they don't have that. Ah, that has a training implication or learning implication, whatever, you, however you want to label that. So I either label that as an S or a T. We select for it, no kidding, each and every time no one gets in the door to that job without it so we don't need to worry about it yes it's enabling knowledge and skill but you know we don't need to worry about it or there's a training implication here mm -hmm. um and so we're going to have to attend to that at some point it'll be on our list of things to attend to when we get into the design phase but we're also then looking for how critical is that one knowledge and skill item so this knowledge and skill matrix takes those knowledge and skills and matrices them against lots of different things so how critical is it to be a master performer can you be a master performer with this yes or no or some gradation you know there's high medium and low there's high high there's high medium there's medium low there's low there's low low there's zero well then how did it get on the list is my question somebody gives it a zero but so I need to gather this additional data here because that helps me, you know, look at it when I get into design. Mm -hmm. And I want to not have people get tired or lazy in design. I want to know, hey, back in analysis, you said this was highly critical. This is difficult to learn. It's highly volatile. And yet you want to package this in now some video, which is, you know, we're going to have to update this because it's highly volatile all the time. That's going to get very expensive. You know, could we put this on a PDF <laughs> and update it that way? And, you know, and so I'm gathering this other additional data, uh, wanting to know how deep do we need to go? Do we need to make people just generally aware of this knowledge and skill item? Do we need to give them some deeper knowledge set on this? Mm -hmm. Do we need to take it to a skill? Um, do they have to learn that skill, spreadsheets, before they learn how to apply it in the job? Yes or no is the answer. So do you need to know that law to a skill level? No, you need to know that law at a knowledge level, and then you'll need to learn how to apply it in the work processes. So that's a kind of a tricky thing in terms of how I gather this data, how I explain the data that I'm gathering to the master performers and other subject matter experts so that they can play along and help me generate this data. I always tell them this is one of the most tedious parts of the process is systematically deriving the enabling knowledge and skills. And for some people, that's true. But for other people, oh, no, that's a lie that guy just told, because this is my life. This is what I do. And I know all this stuff. And somebody is now appreciating it well enough to write it all down. So my clients think that this would be the tedious process. So I often say that to them because they're going, oh, yeah, they'll, they're going to be driven crazy by this. But that's not necessarily true. Master performers have a big ego. They know they're masters of things. And now here's a chance for them to help document all the things that you got to know to be somebody like them. And mm -hmm. so they thrive on this. They get excited when we really tease out, here's the knowledge and skills related to that performance. 
they've seen the knowledge and skill stuffs treated in training and learning and all that stuff, but never as linked right back to the performance. And that excites them because they know that's how that all fits together. Yeah. So, I don't know. I'm not sure if I covered all your question there, but. It, it, yeah, I think we're, we're going in a good direction. So let me just think about then what this looks like in the next part of the process. So we've okay. identified, say, negotiation as one of those, um, you know, critical skills, right? High importance. Um, it does need to be known somewhere between, like, there's some parts that are probably just awareness level, but there are definitely going to be some components of that that are going to be skill level for this particular position. Talk with me about what that conversation then looks like between the designer and those master performers to try to tease out, okay, so so what do you actually need out of the negotiations piece of so this? So the, the design process is kind of a mechanical process. And uh, that's what one of my clients said to me, you've mechanized the design process. Because you take all your analysis data, you create little slips of paper called slip sheets, and here's an output with the task listed and all the other analysis data. So I use output task clusters. So everything that on the performance model, the output, the tasks, the measures, the roles and responsibilities, the typical performance gaps, the typical, the probable causes, all that data is on a piece, little piece of paper because we're going to facilitate the design we're going to process that data. Then we have the same thing with the knowledge and skills. Every row on a knowledge and skill matrices then gets printed off and, and cut up into little pieces of paper that we can use. So when we get to the design, we're talking about, so is this a module, a course, a lesson? You know, we got to start someplace. So I talk about, okay, we're here with a certain scope. And is this like a one-shot deal? Even though learning isn't a one-shot deal. <laughs> when I'm working with a group, I say, is this like, you know, we're going to have a course on this, whether it's online or face-to-face -face or whatever. And they can say yes or no. And we kind of map out a configuration. Well, we think this is three courses, Guy. Okay, well then th three boxes. And I'm usually working at a conference table instead of a flip chart easel now. And I'm laying out flip chart paper on the table and drawing boxes with pens. And so everybody can see there, everybody's sitting around the old design table. And when I say, here's the first output and task. Do we teach this at the beginning? Uh, the first event, the second event, the third event? Oh, first event? Okay. So in that first event, is it towards the beginning or the middle or the end of that event? What do you think? And then we talk about that. And so we're, we're figuring out what is our design major components, major level, where does this first item go? Because it either makes sense to teach us right away or, well, no, hold off on that. You need other things first. Okay, so so I take all the analysis, performance analysis data and, and sort that through whatever configuration. And one of the things I learned a long time ago is every time you have a thing, an event, I call them events, they're modular events. We haven't got to the modularizing them yet, but we're just trying to say there's a three boxes where we're going to be training people on things. Is it going to box number one, two, or three? If it goes into box one, every event has a beginning, middle, and end to keep it simple. And, and, and later on, so we sort everything. Then we go back and we say, okay, let's look at the performance. We're going to teach this performance in this first event, this other performance in the second event, this other performance in this third event. Now let's go back to the first event and sit, decide what is there a beginning, middle, and end to that first event. And so we resort all the data that we have there so that we can kind of get rough out the sequence. And then we go to the second event and the third event. We are revisiting the performance yet again. And invariably, because I've invited people to do this, is anything missing? <laughs> And so people go, you know, there's this output, and I think it goes up there. Well, we didn't have it in our data. I go, okay, blank slip sheet, write it in there by hand, and put it where it goes. Because we're always revisiting the performance because the whole, the whole deal is we want to enable performance. And we haven't figured out whether things are, you know, training or performance guides or job aids or whatever. We've not figured that out yet, but we're just sorting it through, pretending it's all, you know, kind of a classroom experience, if you will or a, a webinar. 
Uh, and so we sort all the performance data and get that sequence. Yeah, this makes sense. Are, are there other ways we could do it? Sure, there are. But this would work. And who says so? The master performers in the room, the other subject matter experts, the supervisors, if we have them, and sometimes the novice performers. And this gets into a question that I asked my project steering team at the beginning, because I asked them to handpick the analysis team members and then to agree about which of the analysis team members, a subset or all of them, go into the design process. Because we're taking people that are master performers off the job to attend to this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes clients are a little anxious about, you know, taking, if we had eight or 12 people on the analysis team, taking all eight or 12 of them and putting them in the design team. And I usually say, you know, I want three or four because that's easier to work with than eight or 12. And, but, but, I'm not sure, you know, who the right people are. I have a sense of them from the analysis efforts, but when I go into design, I may say, you know, uh, there's a, there's three or four of these people that have been on the on the payroll for 25 years here. They all pretty much think alike here. I need one of them. I don't need all of them. Mm -hmm. But all four of them have said they're going to show up whether they're invited or not. You know, that's a business decision. I just I got to tell my client stakeholders, you know, that's what they're saying. Really, I thought they'd hate it and not want to come. No, they want to come because they don't want us to screw this up. They've generated all this great data and they don't want to see it, you know, go off the rails here at some point. So they want to be involved. That's a typical thing that I get where people insist on coming. You tell that project steering team guy, we're going to show up anyway. You better have enough coffee and donuts for all of us. Okay, I'll tell them. We'll see what they say. But so I, but that's what I want to know. Sometimes I need novice performers. And I don't want anybody new that wasn't involved in the analysis effort. So I got to think about this way up front before we did the analysis. Do I need novice performers, people who are somewhat new, proven themselves, know a little bit about the job and have a feel for what do you got to learn first, second and third? Because a 25 year old veteran certainly doesn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's a discussion that you have to have way up front about who is going to be on this analysis team and then the design team. And, what kind of insights do we need? If your analysis team has basically got a good mix of people who've been there, you know, three years and five years and 10 years and 20 years, well, then you're probably okay. But if I, but if, but if when I ask, when I ask the steering team to hand pick the analysis team members, I will always ask, so how long have they been in this job? Oh, 25 years, 24 years, 23 years, 25 years, 23 years, 25 years, 20. All right, so I need some of this kind of new who's sharp and you think you, you know, is an up and comer. And so they might pick a couple additional people. And if it gets to be too many people, I say you pair back, but don't take away those newer people because I need the voice of new performers who have recently begun to master this because I'm going to need their voice when we get into design. And that usually makes sense to my steering team that, oh, yeah. These old guys here, they will they they don't have a clue as to what it's like to be new. They they won't appreciate any of that. We need to have that kind of voice in the design process. So the design process is sort all the analysis data of performance out first. And then the second thing we do is if we've done in our analysis, we've looked at the existing training and assessed it whether or not we can reuse this as is or after modification we begin to sort that data next. So that's the performance. So here's this course we've got, 101 something or other. Where does it go? It teaches certain things. Where's the first instance in our learning flow where this is taught? Oh, it's up there in the beginning in the first event, but it's in the middle. Okay, so this is where this would go. If we're going to teach this course here, it's going to go up there. Because that's what we said, logically, that's where you teach that one. So we sort all the existing uh, courses or learning that we've assessed to say we can use that as is or after modification. Later on, we'll talk about, you know, we're going to have to break that course up and, and use parts of it, or we're going to use it as is because we bought it from some vendor and we don't have the rights to do that. So we're going to have to, you know, we can't mess with it. All right. So we sort all that out. Then we begin to sort out all the enabling knowledge and skills. And so we take the very first category, the very first knowledge and go skill and say, all right, the data here says that this applies to area performance three. Where are we teaching area performance three? 
you know, it's not always in sequence that error performance one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sometimes that happens, but sometimes you start off with 10, then you go to nine, then eight, then three, four, five, you know, and so it's a mix. So you got to go find this. Where does this knowledge and skill item go? And we put that on top of the slip sheet for that area of performance where we're teaching that. Those things go together. And so we're beginning to sort, physically sort all this data. Can you do this through some tool? Yeah. Does it exist? Not that I've ever seen, but you know, it's, it's possible to create some tool that would help you facilitate this if you're going to do this kind of a design effort online with people geographically dispersed. Um, so we need to find where that existing knowledge and skills that's covered in existing content, where does it go in the flow of learning, if you will? And then we sort all the knowledge and skill items into that flow. We're looking for, by the data that we have, this knowledge and skill item enables area performance number three. So where is three in that flow? And we put that knowledge and skill item, that physical piece of paper, if you will, uh, onto the area performance number three pile of data. And so we're sorting this mechanically. All the data gets sorted out. Uh, area of performance data goes first. Uh, existing content that we've assessed for its reuse potential, that goes second. All the enabling knowledge and skill data go third. And we sort that out. Very mechanical. And again, we're always asking the design team, does anything seem to be missing? Any performance outputs or tasks? We don't usually worry about tasks too much, but outputs are key. Um, and then the enabling knowledge and skills. Because we're going through and sorting these things in a systematic way. Here's we're dealing with laws, regulations, and codes. No kidding. And we're, you know, we've got them now. Are there any that we seem to have missed? Well, yes or no is the answer. And then we go to the next category and the next category. And we're going through these systematically and always double, triple checking ourselves to see, is there anything that we somehow missed earlier? And what I found is that the master performers and other subject matter experts that were involved in analysis have been thinking about that effort since we did it. So a week or two or days later or weeks later, they come back together again. And some of them have lists of things that we were missing. And so I said, tell them, all right, I'll board all those things on this parking lot flip chart easel over here. And, but it's your responsibility when we get to these parts here, you've got to, rather than us wait till the end and we're all done and then go look at that list. As we're doing it here, I can't pay attention to everything. You're responsible for getting that new data into the process. And again, it's a matter of, does everybody agree with this? Is this where this goes? Yes or no is the answer. Some agree, some don't. And then we want to talk about, well, is it appropriate for some, but not always for everybody? And so that's a decision, a dialogue that we have, and we make a decision as to how we're going to treat that. So again, performance data down, existing content down, knowledge and skills down. And now we have to talk about, okay, we've got all this stuff in buckets, if you will, and, and, and other buckets within buckets, the beginning and middle and end. And then we need to decide, do we need to even go more granular? I mean, the beginning itself has a beginning and middle and end. And then we go to the middle, which has a beginning and middle and end. And we go to the end. So we're always sorting this. And it always depends on how much data do we have. We kind of spread all this data out so we can take a good look at it. Then we want to look at the target audience date analysis data that we had, because it tells us well, what were the educational and experience backgrounds of some of these people? I mean, the, the job title that we're addressing, do they all do the same outputs and tasks? Or how does the real world treat them? So how many different ways do we have to reorganize our content now? Because our target audience is not everybody with the same job title is everything exactly the same. Now, there are instances where that is true. But in, the, but in most of the projects I've done, that's not always true. People might look at the areas of performance and say, well, everybody does one and two and three. Some people do four. Some people do five. And six and seven, that's a rarity. But, but it is done as part of the job. But not everybody gets assigned those things here. Oh, okay, so now we can begin to have that influence 
our configuration of content, how we're organizing this content so that people can get what they need and skip what they don't need. Now, the other part of the data analysis data on the target audience should have given us some clue as to what people know already, their incoming knowledge and skills, their prior knowledge, uh, based on their education and or experience. So if you're dealing with engineering topics, engin and engineering work performance, and you know that you hire degreed engineers, but you also hire people off the street that don't have that background, well, now you're going to modularize the content a little bit because everybody needs to know how AC, DC electrical theory. And half the target audience may know it already because they have engineering degrees and duh, they got it. So how, how do we organize that so we can modularize that content so the people that don't know it but need it can get it and the people that need it but already know it can skip it? And how do we attend to all of that? And so... That's again another part of you know processing the analysis data and sorting it all out. And when you're operating and designing a curriculum architecture, you usually just stop kind of there. And you know that, okay, I've got a learning and development path, what we used to call training and development path. And we've got, you know, 17 events. And some of these events are self-paced, some of them are coached, some of them are group-paced, and maybe one or two of them is really uh, a pile of job aids <laughs> that it's now time to give guy, the learner, the performer, this, this set of job aids here. And he's been given enough instruction beforehand so that it ought to make sense, but he didn't need him until he got to this point of the learning path. And so we are talking with the, the master performers and other subject matter experts and the supervisors and the new hire, the, the novice performers, to make sure that this is logical, that we can create a path. Now, for every path that's created in the curriculum architecture or instructional architecture effort, we would create a planning guide. Just because the group said, okay, it's logical to do the, the sequence of learning in this way, doesn't mean it's appropriate for everybody. So we give a create a planning guide and have people move things around, change the sequence of things to meet their needs. Well, we've got the annual inventory coming up next month. Guy, you need to learn how to do that. I know on the path, it's way down at the end. But in our situation here, given when you hired in, you need it right away. We're not waiting till the end of the path. So we're going to move that up. And so that's when you're doing the curriculum architecture. If you're really designed, so that's like systems engineering. You do a systems engineering of, of the learning. Now, if you're doing bench level engineering, you're going to actually create the course. You're not just going to create a learning path. You're going to create the actual course. You would take that the design data we have to a, uh, a, another level. You'd have these events and you'd know what goes in the beginning and middle of them. And I would take it to the next step then and design lessons. When I do modular design of events, the modules within the event are lessons. And when I do lesson design, the modular level within a lesson is called an instructional activity. And that's information, demonstration, and application. And what we're doing is we're looking at this data that we have from analysis that's organized. And we could say, well, here's the performance, here's the enabling knowledge and skills. I always design these things kind of in a backward chain. So what are the application exercise? What's the practice and feedback? We're going to have guy weld this thing to that thing. Okay. And is can he just do one of those and that's sufficient? And they go, oh, no, you got to do that three, four, five times. Okay. So how many exercises do we have? Three, four, five. And so we identify that we're going to have this as the final application exercises then my question to my design team is that, do we need to demonstrate any of that before we put them in the application exercise? I mean, have they never seen this before or have they been on the job for a couple of years and have seen it all the time and it's familiar to them? Either we need a demo, yes or no. And so we can use the performance data, which really uh, helps us prescribe, define, design the application exercise and the demonstration. So my columns on my lesson map are info, demo, and apo. 
So the demo and APO are come from the performance data, but we have all this enabling knowledge and skill data, and that's what's going to go in the information. We've got our all of our data sorted, so we don't have to look at all of it. We can look at the part that we have here for this event, and we've sorted that into lessons. We've taken an event and made it into one, two, three, four, 10 lessons, 12 lessons, whatever. So we've resorted the data again, and we can focus in on this little chunk and design it to make sure that it, it's good. So we start with the performance, the uh, application exercises, the appos, the demonstrations, and then what information do we need to give the learner so that the demonstration makes sense so they can go in and get hands-on with doing the performance, performing tasks to produce outputs to stakeholder requirements. Now, when we get into the APO, it's, do we have them do real work? I mean, we just go into the production line and do real work, or we take work that somebody else did last week and we use it as fodder for the application exercise? Or do we simulate it in some way because we don't need to cover every last step of doing it, but we need to cover the key critical steps in that. So we'll do some sort of a simulation exercise. Or do we sit around in a room and talk about it in a case study, kind of a application exercise? You know, what what's the right answer? You know, so as always, it depends and it depends on many different factors, you know. How safe is it for the performers? Uh, what about customer data integrity? Blah, blah, blah. And so we do that level of design at the lesson level. And then on the lesson, we've got all these instructional activities of one of three types, information, demonstration, and application. And we do a little specification sheet on each app, uh, instructional activity. And that's where the analysis data all resides on a application uh, on an instructional activity specification and activity spec. We will have stapled to that. We use staplers instead of tape. Stapled to that output and task data and enabling knowledge and skill data. And all the analysis data, every last little slip sheet that we brought into the design has to go someplace. Now, sometimes it's thrown on the floor and we decide as a group, eh, we're not covering that. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it makes sense. It's part of the job, but you know, we don't really need to cover that. Okay, so then Guy always keeps those things assembled so I know that I can account for every last uh, analysis data item and what happened to it in design. And I can tell my client, you know, we took these five things here and we decided not to do anything with them. And they look at them and they go, yeah, that makes sense to us. Or they can challenge that. But so this is the mechanical process of taking the analysis data and creating the design. Now, I'm going to segue right now into the development because when, I'm do when I've got task data, most of the time, with only rare exceptions, it's simply behavioral tasks. It doesn't include any of the cognitive tasks. It includes the behavioral tasks, the overt tasks that we can see, we can count, we can measure, we can observe them. We can't count, measure, or observe thinking tasks. And for every behavioral task, generally, there's thinking that happens before, during, and after you're doing a behavioral tasks. And so the time to get that is when I get into development. So I'm continuing my analysis, the micro level analysis when I get into development and I'm sitting there with a with an expert or some source or documents and materials or, or whatever. And I'm trying to figure out, so I can teach people, you know, monkey see, monkey do, do this, do this, do this, do this. But what do they got to be thinking about when they're doing those tasks? What are the cognitive tasks that are in parallel with the behavioral tasks? And so this is where I have to learn how to dig deeper with my experts and determine what are the thinking tasks that parallel. And the research shows us that experts have automated 70% of their cognitive tasks when they're just trying to make a decision. Now, to me, when you make a decision, you're you're looking at a situation and you're discriminating, you know, what is this, the same as always, or is this a little bit different? If so, how so? Then do you make a determination? I've got a couple options here on what to do. 
And then you make a decision. I'm going to go with option B. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to go to option C. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to go back to option A, something like that. So I've broken down cognitive tasks into those three D's, if you will. And this is where I've got to get my experts to tell me how to think about this. And I've got to tease this, elicit that from them. And this is where the difficulty lies and that my instruction is always going to be incomplete. My, my instruction can be accurate and appropriate, but it's always going to be incomplete. And I know this, and I tell the groups that I work with, whatever we create, it can be accurate and appropriate, but it's going to be incomplete. And they don't like to hear that. So they're going to work really hard to make me show me wrong. And, and I've got to tease that out of them. But what the research shows is that you and I, if we were experts on something, you know a different 30% and can articulate a different 30% than I can. So Dr. Richard E. Clark, professor emeritus from University of Southern California, he's retired now, but he's been studying this for over 25 years. Cognitive task analysis is his method for teasing out from a group of experts the details to make your content more and more complete. Because what a novice needs is how is to how to think about the things that they're doing before, during, and after they're doing them. And if that if your instruction is missing that, then you're forcing people from formal learning into informal learning, trial and error learning, where they're just trying to figure it out on their own, or social learning, where they're asking their neighbor about, you know, well, how do you do this? And that person may be an expert, and they can tell you 30% that they can articulate, but 70% of it has been automated and they can't recall it for you. And so it's it, it, while that may be effective, it's not efficient. And we're trying to make our learning both effective and efficient. And we need to get as much to the novice performer to teach them, to help them learn how to master performance. And so this is our this is our challenge. And I defer going deep into those details until I get into the development phase when I know I really need it. And then I've got to do create an alpha version and do alpha testing with the with other master performers and the master performers that gave me the data. And then I've got to update that and create a beta version. And then I do beta testing and I take it out to new people and the people that have been involved so far and trying to get a lot of eyes on it and get a lot of responses. And what I've learned through that process is people are always adding to my content because that's just how it is. It was incomplete. And so it's going to get added to. And then I'm gearing everything up really towards a uh, doing a pilot test, a full destructive pilot test to see that even though my instruction is probably incomplete, is it still adequate to the needs of the learners that they can learn enough to be able to go out and perform to some level, some standard. And uh, that this is the tricky part of this is being open to the fact that whatever you've captured, it's going to be incomplete. It's just the nature of the beast. Can you construct learning that helps people learn enough to go to the job, to do the job well enough, safe enough that they can continue to learn and learn the nuances later on? Or are the gaps in our learning and development content, uh, problematic, dangerous, unsafe. And we need to plug that. So that's why we've always got to be doing continuous evaluation, if you will, or be open to feedback from additional learners who may call out something that was missing that everybody missed because that's just due to the non-conscious nature of knowledge. Very long answer. Yeah, uh, but very thorough and very helpful. So thank you. Um, let me pause here. So um, I've got some more time today if you want to continue on with the conversation, but I want to be respectful of your time. Do no, you let's wanna... go ahead. All right. So give you a little break here so you can splice that out of the video. All right. So we've talked a lot about the 
analysis through the development process. Um, let's shift gears a little bit and think about deployment, which um, as I've been going through my career, I've realized is a little bit more complicated than just sending out an email saying it's on SharePoint. Um, and I wanna think a little bit about uh, performance support in particular. So not instructor-led classes, but some of the, the resources that people can access and how you can make sure that those are discovered by the right audiences. Um, one of the resources that you've developed is the book Push Pull Performance Enablement and Guidance Systems, which um, unsolicited plug, but I found that very helpful in my thinking. And, and one of the things that you introduced there is this five tiers of content. So at the top, you've got some things things like um, generic organizational content um, that would probably be relevant to everyone at an awareness level. And then you go down, now you've got some content that might be targeted for the performance of a specific audience, or maybe there's some things that there's some secondary target audiences for. Um, as you're thinking about deploying content to different audiences and, and helping people to discover the right content for them, do you use those five tiers as a like outwardly facing system? Do you have a different way of thinking about that? I, I'm just open to any advice you have for how yeah. to help an audience to find, okay, this will help me. All right. So is it outward facing? Does the target audience know about that configuration, which I'll explain in a moment? The answer is no. Uh, you don't know how General Motors uh, configures all the parts that go into the car that you bought. You don't care. You just make you want the car to work. And if you need a pickup truck instead of a car or an SUV, then you get the right vehicle. But so the five tiers, I've called this my five-tier inventory framework. I've called it my five-tier inventory scheme. But basically, it's if I were to take the bill of materials of finished products or sub-assemblies of my products or knowledge and skills, they would fit into this. So the five tiers is it kind of has a logic to it in terms of, you know, does it does it kind of reflect a learning path, if you will? And yes is the answer. So tier one is orientations to the organization, the uh, marketplace, the uh, function, the division that you're in, the function within that. So you could be working for General Motors and you could be working for Buick and you could be working in purchasing and you could be working in contracts. You know, there's a hierarchy there. And so you're a cog in the great big machinery. So where the hell are you? And we want to help people see that. And we want to see in the vast set of processes that, that an organization really uh, embodies, um, the value chain. We produce, you know, cars. We bring stuff in. We do this. We do that. We do that. And we ship them. And so am I part of that value stream or am I part of this one of the support functions that does support processes to support that value chain in my company. So what's our company all about? Well, we're producing cars, you know, in General Motors case, it was cars and trucks and buses and trains. Oh, okay. So where am, you know, so where am I in the various divisions in the whole hierarchy? You know, where am I in that organization? And then an orientation to my function, my department, an orientation to my job at a very high level along with all the other jobs. So that's tier one is orientations, the kind of stuff you get in onboarding kinds of things. Um, but it helps me understand where as a cog in the great big machinery do I exist? You know, am I on the front end, the middle, <laughs> the end? Yeah. So so the, the tier two then is relates to our analysis data. It is the um, orientation to the area of performance. You know, Guy, welcome to the company. You're in the learning and development organization. You're going to be working in the second D called development. The first D is design. Before that, there's analysis. Before that, there's project planning, blah, blah, blah. But you're this is where you are now. You're going to be doing development, which then leads to deployment but before that, there's design, but you're going to be doing development. You're going to be taking designs and you're going to be creating, uh, I'll make this up, some scripts and some storyboards and you're going to be using videos and some e-learning kind of stuff. You're going to be developing content based on some other design that flows from upstream, downstream to your box. 
And so that's what it's all about. You're going to be doing, you know, and we've broken that down to your key outputs and we can kind of explain those to you. We haven't taught you a darn thing about any of them, but we've demystified the areas of performance that you are responsible for. So the tier two is all of that kind of content, what some might call advanced organizers. They, uh, they help orient people to what is this? You know, before I start learning it, what is it? You know, so because I think that's helpful. Then there's the tier three in this inventory scheme is all sorts of what I generally call generic content, enabling knowledge and skills. Well, here's where you would learn about uh, verbal communications and written communications and negotiations and persuasion and active listening and this law and that law and this policy and that policy and this outside group and this internal group. And so the tier three reflects the 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills. So if I had content on those 17 categories of knowledge and skills, I would find them in my inventory scheme. Think of a bunch of metal file cabinets, if you will, or digital file cabinets where I've parked this data. And so when we when we build a car, we got to go and we got to go get some four wheels and we got to get four tires and we got to get a steering wheel. We got to get a battery. We got to get, get an engine. We got to, you know, and so we're, all that stuff comes out of the inventory system to construct a car. So this is the inventory scheme. Tier three has got all the enabling content. If I bought boatloads of generic content from some vendor, uh, that's basically where it would go. Because the, if I bought a bunch of generic content from a vendor, it wouldn't have the area of performance orientations tier two. It wouldn't tell me, you know, that we're in this marketplace. We do this for a living. These are our customers. This is our competitor. All that orientation stuff of tier one is stuff we would have to kind of create. So there's a place where I can buy content and put it into inventory and then go and use it as I need it. And that's in the tier three. Tier four and five are the how to's because I can get oriented through the uh, advanced organizer, the tier two content on development of learning and development products. I can go get a bunch of how to use this software authoring tool and that content and this and how to create a storyboard and get all that generic content. Now i got to put that together and apply it to my job. So the difference between a tier four and a five is that tier four is how to on shareable content. Tier five is unique. Your job title needs it. Nobody else in the company does. So when it's logging on to the company's intranet, that's a tier four because lots of different job titles need that content and how to uh, uh, apply for uh, expense reimbursement. That's where that goes because lots of people do that kind of stuff. Um, when it comes to creating a storyboard for learning and development, we do that. Now, we can argue about that and say there's other people that do that too. But but for our purposes here, I would have put that in tier five because that's unique. That's not shareable in the sense that, you know, lots of different audiences could do it because when I'm creating unique how-to content, I know who my target audience is exactly. It's easier to pin down. What do they already know? What are we reinforcing versus introducing for the very first time? You know, and, and we teach them how to perform the tasks to produce the outputs to meet the stakeholder requirements. But for tier four, I could have people from purchasing, sales, HR, you know, learning and development, uh, the manufacturing line, lots of different people taking this one chunk of content. So I got to decide what are the implications of having multiple target audience? If it's, ex you know, filling out an expense reimbursement form, that's not that big a deal. But there's other things that are probably a bigger deal. And I have to be careful about what do I demonstrate? Because I, the last thing I need is when I do the information demonstration and application exercises is have the demonstrations or application exercises look like they're for somebody else's job and they're not for me. And why the heck am I in here doing, taking this learning? Um, and so you have to be more conscious of the varied nature of the target audiences when you're doing tier four, how to, no kidding, training. And I always add the no kidding on here because I want people to know when we talk, when we label content as how to, 
it's no kidding. We're going to teach you how to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, whatever it is. Um, and the acid test, the practice exercises and the and the test that at the end is, can you do it? Not do you know it? So when we're doing tier four and five content, we're not going to give a quiz or a knowledge test with recognition or recall. We're going to actually have you do the performance of something. And it may require that you are able to recall things or recognize the right answer on a multiple choice, but but we have to go beyond that when we're doing tier four and five content. The enabling knowledge and skills, sometimes we can get by with just testing your knowledge. We can quiz you, we can test you. Sometimes there's a hands-on test like create a spreadsheet. You know, can I do this? Can I create the spreadsheet for the exercise, whatever? But but that's not real work. That's just creating an enabling knowledge and skill piece of work. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Now, as we're deploying some of this content, um, we talked about this a little bit in the development process. So you've got uh, the structure of infos, demos, and apos. And, and certainly one of the things that I see is that um, as I look at the types of programs I've designed in the past, and so I'll, I'll be the guilty one here, um, I've probably had a lot of content in some of those instructor-led experiences that really did belong as a self-paced format, something separate. Um, and so think about how to, to be a little bit more efficient with time. I know you've talked about how to deploy you know, job support and performance aids by wrapping them in a training experience. So if the stakeholder isn't quite comfortable with like, well, here's a job aid on this, you can give people, here's a training on how to use this job aid. And by the way, now you've got that available. Um, I'm curious if you've got advice for when you're going in the other direction. So if you've got uh, something that really does belong in instructor-led training, but there's maybe info or Apple or parts of it that, sorry, info or demo parts of it that don't need to be live. Right. How do you uh, go about like structuring things so that employees don't show up to the instructor-led part and are fish out of water because they didn't do the stuff they were supposed yeah. to do in order to be prepared for that experience? I had a client back in the 1980s in Chicago, a, a heating, air conditioning, and ventilation company that basically flew everybody into Chicago from all over North America and gave them a pretest that tested the the pre work that people were supposed to have done, and if the people flunked the pre test, they sent them home. Well, eventually, managers got really upset, and uh, the zone managers got really upset because they were buying all these airplane tickets only to have people come home early without taking the training. So this was a a, a matter of tension. But the client said, you know, uh, you know, if we don't do that. We're going to then have to cover the pre-readings and we're actually rewarding people that didn't do meet the expectations and we're punishing those people who did because they got to sit through it all over again and they learn not to do it because why should I do it? So this is a political issue and the client, the clients that L&D works for, they're the ones who are responsible for learning. They're the ones who are responsible for performance. We're in place to support them and get that done because we know how to do that better than they do. But ultimately, they're the ones who are responsible. So this is one of those things where you have to negotiate with your clients. Now, I've had project steering teams decide that, you know, we can't force them to do that. They're so busy with everything else that we've loaded onto them that, guy, we're not going to do this. So then I would say, well, we're not going to take content out and push it out. We'll cover it in the group paced instruction, whether that's online or face to face. But that's how we're going to do it because we can't trust. And then if people, half the room, half the people show up and they haven't done the pre work, they're going to be a drag on the whole thing and they're going to negatively affect the others. And so rather than pretend that we could, because we can push some of this content out, have it pre-work, it's the old flip the classroom thing. But my experience says that people won't do it. They're too busy. 
And there's no consequence system. There's no communication that says, not only are we going to fly you to Chicago and the training organization is going to send you back to the airport and send you home, we're going to have the division manager call on your branch manager who's going to beat on your department manager who's then going to thusly beat on you for having wasted X number of dollars. Because we're serious about this. But so you're not going to find that too often, you know, so, you know, this is my fantasy that, you know, organization was actually put some teeth behind this, make examples of some people and get everybody else's attention so that people quit doing that, that they do the pre-work, that they go in, that they're going to be tested. So the client, this was back again in the early 80s. So you couldn't pre-test online in advance and then tell people not to bother to come, you know, because that would have been easier to do. But but the technology that we had back in those days didn't really aff afford that. You couldn't do that easily. So it wasn't really feasible. So I think ideally you want to take some of the content and parse it out and put it into self-paced and or coached means before people show up. I ideally, you'd give people the information and demonstrations before they showed up and they would practice something that required interpersonal skills and they do role plays or whatever and really hone those skills, hone that performance capability in a group-paced environment um, because we've got all the technology to help us do that nowadays. But but so it's a matter as to whether or not that's really politically feasible, whether people are going to go along with doing it. And so these are some of the questions that you have to ask. I asked clients about this early on. I I had clients complain that I was I would ask about transfer. How are we going to ensure transfer? I'm worried about transfer. Guy, you haven't even done the analysis yet. You know, my clients might say to me, why are you bringing that up now? Because it's <laughs> going to be an issue, I bet. And the... The owners of the issue who can resolve it are you guys, not me, but I'm going to get blamed for it if it doesn't transfer. <laughs> and they go, oh, okay, maybe. Um, and so I would talk about what are the barriers to transfer? Are we going to teach people all this stuff here? And then the supervisor is going to say, guy, you learner, you're doing it some newfangled way. And I learned it the old fangled way here. I want you to do it the old fangled way so I can manage that because otherwise I don't know what you're doing. And then we just trained Guy on all this stuff, spent all this money, invested all this time and effort for naught. And I would bring that up in that kind of a way to my project steering team and let them think about that. And, and this is in the kickoff. Then I do the analysis and bring back the analysis data. And before I close the meeting, I'd say, I'd be wondering out loud, what are the barriers to transfer? Because if we're trying to have an impact on people's performance so that they're performing better, faster, and treat cheaper, if it doesn't transfer, we're never going to get that. We're going to have not a positive return on investment, not even nil. It's going to be negative. And they go, oh, you know, those are that's business kind of language he's using here. Hmm. Um, and so I would try to get them to begin to think about that and say, you know, do we need to one of my clients, Eli Lilly? back in the 90s, had a rule for vendors that if they produced content for a target audience, they had to produce something for the supervisor. And that was just part of the deal here. So you better cook that into your response and your schedules and your pricing and all that stuff. But whatever you create, you're going to have to do something for the supervisor because the supervisor is the person responsible for whether or not guy applies what he learns. And if he doesn't learn it completely, maybe the continuation of the application exercises is doing real work under the guidance of the supervisor. Does the supervisor know what to do, how to do it, how to give constructive feedback that's reinforcing or corrective? You know, do we have skilled supervisors that can do that? And how critical is that? So when we do systems thinking along these lines, we have to think about, yeah, maybe it's not just the supervisor. Maybe the supervisor is going to be fine with this, but you go out there and the peers who haven't been trained, they're going to shut it down. They're going to get guy to do it the old way that we've always done it rather than this newfangled way because they don't understand it. And so perhaps we needed something for the other people involved. Guy has his role in this cross-functional process He's doing it some new way that we didn't do it that way last week and the months before, the years before. 
So does do we need to give something to the other audit, rest of the performers in the processes so that they understand Guy has been trained to do this differently because this is a better, faster, and cheaper. It's different, but not so much. And maybe we need to explain that to everybody. And maybe that would help uh, grease the skids of transfer from learning back into the performance context. And so the, th this is all tricky stuff that you we need to attend to. But as I always tell my clients, this is on you, not on us. I mean, we'll get beat up. Oh, sure. Yeah, you can blame us because, you know, we're the whipping boys. But but it's really going to be you. And if this is on high stakes or medium stakes performance, you live with the consequences of whether this transfers and has impact or not. So give me the best people for analysis and design. Help me with the transfer. Do we need to attend to the supervisors and the other peers and the processes or what? And what else can you do in your management chain of command down to the supervisor, down to the performers to make sure that this investment isn't for naught? And this is this has led to some very, very interesting uh, discussions by my client groups. Well, we'll put in a reward system. Yeah, we'll test. We'll recognize people in the in the company newsletter or something, you know, about people who are really, you know, learned this and went out and started doing it. And make it not only acceptable, but it's part of the expectations of performance now. And I try to put that onus back on the client and on the management. Now you have to look at, you know, do I have a client? Do I have a project steering team? Do I have the people that are really in control of all of this? Who am I dealing with as I'm doing this project here? Am I interacting with the right people? Or am I dealing with some intermediary? And do I need them to get the message back to the people that hold the purse strings and the levers of performance so that they can help make sure that this happens? But I've got to initially start off by making other people aware that these are issues, no kidding, that we you attend to, no kidding, and that I can't do much about it, no kidding, and it's really on you, no kidding, but I'll catch the blame, and that's just the way life is. And we can all laugh about that. But then we know, oh, maybe we do need to do something about that. Yeah. Excellent. One final area to explore. I know that this has been quite the conversation. So thank you very much again for, for making the time. Um, as I mentioned at the start, I work in a manufacturing context. And um, as I talk with a number of my peers, both in this sector, but also places like healthcare, retail, right? There's, there's a lot of folks who uh, are doing work and it's not in front of a computer or it's not in an environment where just digital resources are, you know, tip of the finger in a way that a lot of the current conversations around like things like workflow learning or performance support kind of assume. Um, I know this is something that you've talked about a little bit in the past. You talk about how like for manufacturing workers, if you know their hands are busy, right? Maybe the right sort of performance support is an audio format where they can just listen to it rather than having to like page through something or like pull up a, a resource on um you know a, a directory or something like that. Um I, I'm just curious, and I'll make this very broad. What advice can you give for making performance enablement and guidance um accessible for deskless? employees you know what what should we be thinking about to not just cater to the folks who live in you know cubicles in front of a computer for you know however many hours a day exactly yeah this is why i think the power of the design team because when you're doing design you're really designing for a certain means of deployment group paced self paced coached whatever or a blend and when you when you decided, you know, one of the questions that you ask people in the design process is, does the performance context demand a memorized performance response? Because there's no time or it's just too inconvenient to reference something. And, you know, if you're doing work on the top of a utility pole and your hands are full and there's live wires all around you, <laughs> you don't have time to take a break, climb down and, and refer to something or get out your smartphone or tablet or something and read what you need, you might need something else. And so what is that? What's feasible under all of the conditions of the variances of the performance context? 
well, sometimes we're doing this out there and it's, you know, it's a regular day and it's no big deal. Sometimes guy, it's, you know, 120 degrees out and you're sitting at the top of this pole and, you know, or it's freezing and you're in rain and sleet, you know? So those are the variances in the context. What is the appropriate way to provide things that can be referenced? So if, if the learning context doesn't demand a reference response and somebody can take the moment that they need to, to reference something to get the step-by-step -step instructions that are necessary for them to perform, then they should do that. You know, I, I, I put this on this and this on this here and the reading is 97. So what do I do? It's not 12, it's 97. And so maybe I need to look that up. Maybe that's not static information, but dynamic information and it changes. So this is this is different this week than last week, whatever the case is. So having the, the, how we intend to deploy our content should be a decision by the users of that content because they know best. I'll never know. I could guess, and sometimes I'll be right, but I'll probably be wrong often enough that I will make a mistake and pick the wrong thing. So involving the, the master performers and novice performers, if you will, in making some of those decisions of how to package and deploy this stuff is really critical. Um, and then having their managers buy into it. And what you always want to do is you want to figure out, well, what do they already have in place? And can I use that, leverage that? Or if whatever they have in place is inadequate and they need to invest in something new, they need to be part of the uh, purchasing the the specification of what the requirements are, the needs, uh, the how to make sure that something is robust to all the variances under which something is going to be used. But but that, so that's a tricky thing. But the first thing is, you know, what needs to be done and performed? Can it be referenced? Will will the performance context be okay with guy taking a moment to reference something and then doing the performance? Um, or no, there's times, you know, 99% of the time you can get by with that, but there's that 1% of the time where there ain't no time for referencing things. You got to know it. All right. So we've got to teach it to the guy. Then it becomes a question of um, how often will he be doing that to reinforce it and to really learn it? Or is it something he's going to do once every blue moon and he's going to forget it before the next time? So how do we do spaced learning to keep that at the top? at the top of what he's memorized so that he can uh, recall it on demand. And so those kinds of dialogues are, you have to happen with the target audience and the people in the target audience who really have been there and done that and can make a, a, a more informed uh, decision or have more informed discussions about what are those variances and we need to contend with all of those. Or yeah, the stuff that happens only 20% of the time, Forget it. You know, I mean, the world won't come to an end if guy climbs down off the pole and goes to the truck and and references something. Um, but there's going to be those times where they say, absolutely not. He's going to have to have things memorized. So how we enable performance or support performance has to happen. Now, there are new tools that are coming out. I've had an exchange with uh, uh, Robert uh, Brinkerhoff, who's kind of famous for his one of his approaches to um, evaluation of instruction. He's a former professor uh, from, uh, I think, Western Michigan. And uh, sorry, Rob, if I got that wrong. But um, but he was telling me about a student of his that has created this audio uh, capability for audio references so that it would talk you through the steps you've got to take. Now, I don't know exactly how it all works and everything, but ideally I would say, you know, tell me what's next. And it would tell me. And then when I finished that, I would say, tell me what's next. And it would tell me, and I would say, tell me what's next. And I'd say, you're all done, go home. And, and, but so there are these capabilities that are coming out that, but we have to decide, you know, what's that context and what's right. Do I, can I take audio directions or am I going to need a visual as well? And will I have to have smart glasses to help me do that. So the world of technology has been evolving since I got into this business in 1979, and it changes how we do our work, how we administrate our work, and how we deploy our work. And we have to keep on top of that evolving set of digital technology and tools that can help us deploy things more appropriately. 
but we can't be prescribing to our clients that they get this and they get that and they get all these other things here. We need to think about this holistically at the very beginning. Given our context and our target audiences, what are we going to need? And how how can we enable that? If you're in manufacturing and people are in buildings and you know they're not out there in the elements and the weather doing their work, I guess. And so you know, that changes everything. But for everybody else, they really need to look at where's the performance context, the environment that it's in. What are some of the issues that people have to contend with? It's not the everyday issues necessarily. It's that once in a blue moon thing. How are you going to handle that? And is that part of our remit that we should be helping people handle those unusual cases? Because if the stakes are high enough, the answer is, Hell yes, we should be helping them with that. But if the stakes are medium to low, then maybe we don't need to worry about it so much. So one of the other issues is we always have to be looking at how we're attending to the high stakes, high risk, high reward performance that our target audiences are engaged in. Does that help? It does. Excellent. Well, Guy, thank you so much for making the time today. I really enjoyed this conversation. Um, if you are watching this on a recording, I hope that you found it informative as well. Um, but I really appreciate, Guy, that you took the time to share your experience. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to have future conversations and just keep going deeper into this world. Well, thank you, Colin. I'm happy to do this. And uh, I'm going to put your contact information uh, from LinkedIn into the show notes on the YouTube video. And I will put in some other references related to the things we talked about here today. Excellent. Well, again, thanks so much for, for making the time and for having a great conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.